Right. Hello, everyone. It's Dr. Kel Dr. Ken Gilman here. I decided it was about time that I said something about the other monoamine oxidase inhibitor drugs other than tranylcypramine, Parnade. Uh, people seem to think that I only talk about Parnade, which to some extent is true. And the reason for that, let me just put it in context, in context uh, quickly for everyone. The reason for that is that uh, my scientific papers about this have used Parnate as the reference point, if you like, because it's got, in my view, uh, a better side effect profile. It is more suitable for a greater percentage uh, of patients. Um, but my scientific papers have dealt with phenylzine as well and described, really for the first time in the modern literature, the clear differences between the two in terms of their properties pharmacologically uh, and their uh, symptom benefit profile, if you like. Uh, so that's why when I talk about MAOIs, I often say Parnate when I'm really making comments that are just as applicable to phenylzine as they are to tranylcypramine, phenylzine, nardil, um, tranylcypramine, Parnade. Um, when I'm writing and talking as, as a pharmacologist, as it were, I, I use the proper names like tranylcypramine. But of course, when I'm speaking to people, be it doctors or patients, when I do, you know, consultations over the internet, I, I tend to use trade names because people find them easier to sort of spell and remember. Um, you know, tranyl cypramine's a bit of a difficult one to spell. You get muddled up with the I's and the Y's and all the rest of it. And as I often say to people, these are all invented words anyway, so there's no right or wrong way of pronouncing them. And to some extent, there's no right or wrong way of spelling them, because if you're looking in the scientific literature, you often have to search for aberrant spellings of these uh, drug names, because lots of people who write scientific papers about them spell them wrongly or differently. So it is relevant to appreciate that. So first, remember that unless I say to the contrary, it's highly likely that comments that I'm making about Parnate uh, apply equally to the other MAOIs. When I say the other MAOIs, um, obviously, in terms of the old irreversible MAOIs, we're talking about phenylzine nardil, but also isocarboxazid. Marplan uh, is the trade name. I don't know whether in some countries somewhere in the world uh, there'll be preparations of isocarboxazid or phenylzine that are marketed with different names, I'm sure there are. Uh, so it's relevant to appreciate that. But for practical purposes, um, usually it's easier just to refer to Nardil and Marplan. So those two drugs, phenylzine and isocarboxazid, are the only other two of the old generation of monoamine oxidase inhibitors that are still available. Um, I can't tell you exactly which ones are available in which countries uh, comprehensively, uh, but certainly I know that all three are available uh, in the USA. I don't think Marplan is available in the UK anymore. Uh, even Phenylzine is, is struggling in the UK, I think. But Isocarboxazid, I think, is the only MAOI available in, is it the Netherlands or Denmark or whatever? Um, so the situation's strange, to say the least, and quite irrational. Uh, and I, as many people who've 
read much of what I've written or listened to many of my videos will know uh, that's the purpose of my international expert group and much of what I do is to try to change that situation and get these drugs more widely uh, used, recognized and marketed. It's an uphill struggle. Uh, so it's important to do whatever you can to persuade anybody you have influence over that uh, they need to take more notice of these drugs. Okay, so let's get to the clinical use and the pharmacology of, let's start with phenylzine nardole. Its chemical structure is completely different to tranylcypramine. It was derived directly from the old, well, the original anti-tuberculous drugs, isoniazid and ipronazid, which led to the recognition of the antidepressant effect of blocking monoamine oxidase. Uh, and so it's what's called a hydrazine-based monoamine oxidase inhibitor because the central molecule that it's synthesized from is rocket fuel, hydrazine. Isocarboxazid is the same, it's a hydrazine. It's slightly different to phenylzine with some slightly different pharmacological property, which I'll mention in a moment. A lot of people who've used both, and there aren't many, but, but of the people who are familiar with using both of those drugs and can, can compare them directly from personal experience, uh, uh, some people refer to iso isocarboxazid as nardil light. And what they mean by that is it seems to be a little bit kinder on the system uh, and to produce perhaps less side effects. Um, although a rigorous documentation of the difference between the side effects of those two is uh, absent. Uh, okay, so let's first of all talk a little about how exactly is phenylzine different to tranylcypramine? That's enumerated in detail in my review paper about MAOIs, which I think is on the website or which you can access via the internet using the usual jiggery pokery and methods. Um, phenylzine inhibits GABA transaminase, which isocarboxazid doesn't do, and certainly tranylcypramine doesn't do. And that's what appears to give phenylzine the unique property uh, and difference from tranylcypramine of having an excellent, unique action against severe forms of anxiety, especially social anxiety and phobic anxiety. Although again, I would say that I don't think there's a rigorous documentation of whether it's really selective for different sorts of anxiety, but it's generally held that what I've just said is, is the case. But basically it's very good for anxiety. And there are undoubtedly people who've had absolutely crippling social anxiety and phobic anxiety uh, that's not been usefully addressed by any other technique, whether it's intense CBT, psychological type treatment, or other drugs like SSRIs or clomipramine, which is often very good for anxiety, etc. Uh, and I'm sure any doctor who's got much experience in using it will say that um, you occasionally get patients who've had lifelong crippling anxiety who, who say that their life's been changed by phenylzine and it's just eliminated the anxiety dramatically and quickly. So that really is a unique difference. And that's why I would generally use tranylcypramine first, because it was only those patients who had primary social anxiety and phobic anxiety who would definitely preferentially benefit from having phenylzine first rather than tranylcypramine. And they're relatively rare. So most people with anxiety, it's secondary to their depressive illness, uh, and therefore I tended to use 
channel cyprimine as a first choice treatment. And because it was so successful, I didn't treat a great number of patients with phenylzine. So that's from point of view of symptoms, the unique property of phenylzine and where it remains invaluable, um, where no other drug we know of uh, has such an excellent effect. As far as its effectiveness in the other conditions where we would consider using an MAOI, especially severe depression, I personally don't think there's much difference between channel cypramine and phenylzine in overall effectiveness. Many people listening may know that the first Medical Research Council trial of phenylzine versus imipramine versus whatever else, ECT, I think, um, way back in the 60s, was a dog's breakfast of a trial, did what so often still happens, and that was to use what many people would consider ineffective or sub suboptimally effective doses of phenylzine, i.e. the maximum dose in that MRC trial and many other trials has been 45 milligrams daily. And people often say that, you know, that's the maximum dose. Just like a lot of people have said for a long time that the maximum dose of channel cypromine is 30 or 40 milligrams. And I can absolutely assure you that almost all of the members of, of the international MAI experts group that I convened th three years or so ago would say that's absolutely not true. A great proportion of patients benefit from need and benefit from much higher doses. So I think most people would agree that the appropriate dose range for Nardil, phenylzine, is 45 to 90 milligrams, not 30 to 45 milligrams. I personally would say 45 is the minimum dose. I've not seen many patients who've got better with less than that. And some people need 120 milligrams. I, I, when I did use phenylzine, uh, as you know, if people had severe depression, I, I would use 90 to 120 milligrams. Uh, and I suspect that's why many people think it's not very effective for depression and have only ever used it for these anxiety syndromes uh, that I described a minute or two ago. So that's really phenylzine and its use. Side effect wise, and again, the details of this are on the website and particularly in that review paper I wrote about MAOIs. Um, there are definite disadvantages for a substantial proportion of patients who take phenylzine, and that is a greater effect on weight gain. Quite a lot of patients who take phenylzine gain quite large amounts of weight. And secondly, there seems little doubt that phenylzine has more deleterious effects on people's sexual functioning, um, whereas Parnate does not. Uh, Parnate's probably the best drug we've got for restoring people's sexual drive and inclination to normal without interfering with the sort of um, functionality of all of that kind of business of orgasm and everything else associated with it. Uh, which makes it, of course, a very, very good drug, especially for younger people who don't want to gain weight, especially females. So that's one of the main reasons why I made phenylzine a second choice after Parnay uh, for um, a great majority of patients, unless they had severe primary anxiety. Uh, other side effects of phenylzine, it does seem to cause a little bit of peripheral neuropathy uh, secondary to B6 deficiency, pyridoxine B6, in a small proportion of people. Um, I note that this is very poorly documented, despite the drug being in use for such a long time. Very few psychiatrists have ever bothered to measure pyridoxine levels before and after treatment, which is what I used to do. Um, but they are. Uh, but certainly the similar anti-tuberculous drugs, which are still used, like pronazid and isonazid, um, the guidelines for the treatment of patients with those drugs suggest that people who are in any way debilitated 
you know, the usual sort of list of very young, very old, chronic physical illness, people with gut absorption difficulties, um, blah, 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 should be given uh, supplementary pyridoxin if they're on anti-tuberculous treatment. Uh, and uh, generally speaking, other fit, healthy patients eating a normal diet uh, don't get significant B6 deficiency. And one, I think, could reasonably suppose that that's going to be the same with phenylzine. Um, nevertheless, it's my view that it's so quick, easy and cheap to measure people's B6 levels that it seems to me to make sense to measure them before and after, uh, you know, say, before treatment starts and you know, maybe six months after if people are taking it for that longer period of time. It, it, it just makes sense, doesn't it? Um, peripheral edema and a little bit of neuropathy so can occur with phenylzine. Uh, one of the papers written by one of the fellows in uh, Holland or Denmark, Denmark it is, I think, uh, Jens, uh, he, um, he reckons that pyridoxin replacement reduces peripheral edema uh, and stuff with isocarboxazid. Uh, and whether or not that's worth trying if people have got edema with phenylzine, I'm sure it is. It can't do too much harm as long as the doses are not super high. The doses of pyridoxin, I mean, are not you know, crazily high, but, but giving normal replacement doses certainly seems sensible to me and is worth a try if, if those side effects are helpful. People give hydrazine, hydrazine diuretics to help the uh, peripheral edema with uh, Nardil, uh, and I think that can help sometimes. I've not got much experience of that. Uh, that pretty much covers, I think, most of the side effects of phenylzine that are different to the other MAOIs, is what I mean, um, that are unique to phenylzine. Um, so uh, otherwise, the main things people encounter with phenylzine are the usual difficulties with sleeplessness and feeling a bit overstimulated. That seems to occur with phenylzine as well as, well as with tranylcypramine which sort of goes against a bit the idea that tranylcypramine only does it because it's got that you know, supposed amphetamine-like action, which is a very dubious proposition in many ways. It's got, it certainly has got a slight stimulant action, but to call that an amphetamine-like action is perhaps a little bit misleading. It, it, it doesn't have amphetamine as a metabolite, um, but lots of drugs have an indirect stimulant action. Yeah, I really can't think of any other substantial differences off the top of my head as far as phenylzine is concerned. Uh, as far as isocarboxazid is concerned, uh, first, I would declare no first-hand practical experience of using it because by the time I started in the 70s, it had either fallen out of use or perhaps wasn't even available in the UK anymore. I can't even remember. We certainly never used it. Um, As I said, it's available in America and one or other European countries, but not most of them. So it's not much used at all, which is a shame. It undoubtedly has a, a place. And certainly there are several uh, experts in, in the international group who, who use it uh, and who find that some patients who don't get on with phenylzine get on very well with isocarboxazine. Um, but otherwise, I think isocarboxazine's general side effects are, are pretty similar. Except perhaps it causes less weight gain than phenylzine. I hope that goes some way to rectifying the impression that uh, I ignore phenylzine and, uh, and isocarboxazine. Um, and I think that... Uh, I'll, I'll try to do a... A commentary, a written commentary on the website with some of this material uh, in it, just so that there's something permanent on the website as well. But I don't really think there's much else to say. Uh, so it's a very, well, phenylzine is a very valuable drug. 
And sometimes when phenylzine doesn't suit people, it seems clear from the experience of other experts in, in the group that isocarboxazid can be uh, very helpful and uh, more agreeable to take. So they're both drugs that have a definite place in the treatment of a small number of patients. All right, well, as usual, uh, just remember one, there's not a great deal of point in sending comments on YouTube uh, about different things to do with the pharmacology of these drugs and all that stuff. It's much better saved as a, as a message via the website to me where I can add comments in response as appropriate when I write commentaries. Uh, don't forget that there's lots of other material on the website and in my scientific publications. Uh, and also, don't forget that it's individual people uh, spreading the word about the information on the website and the videos and things that uh, plays a big role in making the knowledge available to other people and, you know, all this business of increasing the ranking on different platforms and all that kind of stuff. Uh, and that's where individuals really can make a difference, even if they can't... Uh, uh, financially afford to make a small contribution to help our efforts on the website. Um, which, please consider that if you're in a position to do so. All right, folks, bye for now.